Hey, Brian. Um, I'm glad that you could be here to talk to me today because I have felt like the entire time I've known you, you've been dribbling out like awesome comic stories casually offhand. And, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just think you, I just think you've got so much in there. I, I don't know how many of them are repeatable in a, you know, public, uh, you know, setting, but sure. <laughs> right. I don't know. I guess I want a little sneak peek at the memoirs. Yeah. So, yeah. but so my guest is Brian David Marshall, who I actually um, first came to know through Magic the Gathering. Uh, Brian is well known in that community and was the like one of the voices of the Magic Pro Tour, historian of the Pro Tour, had a weekly column on the, the big Magic the Gathering website and um, a whole career there. And I feel like Brian has had several like fascinating careers. So that's kind of why I wanted to talk to him because as I got to know him through Magic, um, I started to get little hints here and there that he'd had a big, like a long, career in comics as well in all different roles and that um was really interesting to me and I you know I I only I knew you online at first and it uh somehow came out that you were friends with Evan Dorkin who was a big uh, inspiration for me when I was uh, a lot younger and sort of just out of the blue you mailed me this which oh my is a, god a promotional poster for Pirate Corps which was a uh Evan Dorkin, one of Evan Dorkin's first comics that was published by Eternity. That was, and, yeah, that was um, me. <laughs> yeah, so that was kind of emblematic of the sort of community generosity you had to just like mailing that to some stranger. I mean, that was like totally awesome to receive, but um, you know, it hinted at some some fascinating backstory there. So eventually, we met up, I think, at Comic Con for the first time, and oh yeah, you know, kind of became friends. So. That's the that's the backstory of how I met you and, and like why I thought this would be interesting to, to talk to you in particular because that period of time of comics that um, that eternity era and kind of the black and white boom and the, the kind of the time between the beginning of the black and white boom to the the image explosion era is a little bit like fascinating to me and also just mysterious in terms of like how the business was working at that time so those are those are particular areas of interest to me but um that's I mean it's funny it's a perfect way to frame like Eternity Comics right because Eternity comes like right on the heels of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles right Turtles blows up right and it's like any other fad that we've seen over the course of our lives right and everyone's like oh black and white comics right and it was there was a lot of uh, movement to try to capitalize on on that excitement, and so Eternity published a lot of a lot of comics there. Eternity eventually becomes Malibu Publishing, and then Malibu actually kind of like hands off that new era because Malibu publishes for Image Comics the first issues of uh, a lot of those Image titles. I don't remember right. if it was all. I was I was gone by then, but right, um, you know. So there, it really is like a perfect bridge from like, you know, like that Alan Moore era of like, you know, Watchmen and, and, and you know, like that heyday of like really good comics coming out from DC. And then there's like that black and white boom. And then there's like the image, Superman dies and image comics starts. Right, yeah. So um, that that's, that's the kind of connection that I'm interested in for the most part, but let's hear about like, how did, what's your, comics origin story like how did first I guess I want to get into like the different hats you wore and, and sure jobs you had but like going way back like how did you get into comics so I I, I always I always like comics right like I, I remember being in a barber shop when I was like I mean gotta be I've got to be less than five years old just based on where I was living at the time and I can distinctly remember to cover of Amazing Spider-Man. It's like a John Romita issue. It's somewhere in the 150s, I think. And it's um, the man wolf attacking J. Jonah Jameson. And Spider-Man kind of swinging in to like save the day and uh, J. Jonah Jameson begging him not to hurt man wolf because he's his son. And 
another issue next to it on the thing, there were three comics on, on the like, you know, the table at the barbershop and they burnt it to my head. It's that one. The next issue, I think, of that run, which is Man Wolf and Spider Man fighting, like maybe on the hood of a car. Okay. And um, Spider Man's like, like, no, you know, and Mary, I think Mary Jane's there and he's like, not like Gwen, right? You know, it's or something. And I'm like, you know, as a kid, even like, I just remember being like, what I, I you know, mental note, who was Gwen, right? Like, it just hooked me. Like, I, I'm a sucker for that kind of like, there's all this continuity going on, but you don't know what it is when you just pick up one comic and you need to puzzle it out. And then the third comic was an issue of Sad Sack. <laughs> like, yep. You know, the you know military kind of grunt character, you know, comedy, kind of like cut rate Beetle Bailey. I don't know, or maybe Beetle Bailey's cut rate Sad Sack. I'm not sure which is which. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, but I remember those those three comics kind of always had me like burnt themselves into my brain uh years later i i got into um reading you know marvel comics as a teenager i I, like weirdly comics i got into comics through reading trade paperbacks right like origin marvel origins son of origins um i have i have all the books like even right here too still um there was also a mysteries in space collection and a dc what's it what was it called America at War collection, which just collected all these like old, like Silver Age, you know, DC stories. I loved those. And I started digging for more. And then I would, you know, ask for presents at Christmas or, you know, Hanukkah. We had a a big extended family across multiple religions Mm -hmm. and, you know, would double up on uh, asking for comic gifts, right? Like books. And I would get uh, all these great things. And then as it turns out, my uncle Stanley this is, by the way, just a very long origin story. I apologize. Um, okay. Michael Stanley, when he was at, he was a high school teacher and he worked with Phil Suling, uh, as who was a high school teacher. And uh, the two of them both kind of decided simultaneously to like quit their jobs and pursue their passions. And uh, Phil Suling went and formed Seagate Distribution and basically invented the direct market for comic books. Right. And uh, my uncle Stanley went and basically formed a mail order stamp business, like for collectors. And like, he, he was really into stamps. That was his thing. Uh-huh. Wildly successful. I think probably much more successful than Phil Suling, although not as impactful maybe right. as Phil Suling. Um, and uh, so like, I just would hear all these kind of like, weird insidery stories about the comic book business and like i don't know i was like a 10 year old kid who was hearing things about the direct market <laughs> like like you know and uh and knew where comic stores were right at a time where it wasn't easy to find comic stores so my uncle would be like hey let's go all right you want to you know spend some money and go get some comics let's go we're going to go to brighton beach and there's a comic store there and let's we're going to go here and you know he was able to he knew where they were uh, which yeah. was a big a big deal um, uh, and, uh, so yeah, that, that kind of just got me into comics and then I, I fell out of them a little bit, probably, you know, for a while. And then, um, you know, I mean, it's, it sounds crazy, but uncanny X-Men 141, like whatever October, 1980, whatever it is, I bought that off a newsstand. I was like, what is this? I haven't read X-Men in forever. You know, I'd read, uh, like off and on some of the dark phoenix saga right but like that cover for whatever reason just did its job and i bought it and i read it and i'm like crap i need the second part went back to that newsstand like basically every day for a month until it was out and then it was like "Ah, i i need to find a comic store you know in, in my area now and found a comic store and uh I just decided that I wanted to make comics. I don't know, you know, I became obsessed the way we do about, you know, games and things. And uh, I was like, I'm gonna make, I wanna make comics. And I'm going to, and I decided I'm gonna work at that comic shop. I'm gonna meet somebody in the comic industry. I'm gonna offer to be their intern assistant, whatever I need to do to get my foot in the door. 
And then when somebody screws up and can't meet a deadline uh, on a writing front, I'm going to jump into the, meanwhile, I'm, I'm like 15 years old here at this point, right? Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a kid. Uh, this is, this is, this is, you know, a couple of years after X-Men 141 already, but, um, and I, uh, and that's what happened. I, I worked in a comic shop. I met this guy, Dave Singer. Dave Singer was starting a comic company called Deluxe Comics. He was working with George Perez and Steve Ditko and, you know, Roy Thomas and Tom and Mary Beerbaum and Keith Giffen and Steve Ditko and Rich Buckler. And, and, you know, and he was like, and his office was less than 10 blocks from where I grew up, right? You know, 10 blocks from my house. And I was like, hey, I want to work for you. I will, you know, I don't, you don't need to pay me. I just want to learn the industry. I came in, I started working. I would come in after school. Uh, you know, my first, one of my first assignments was to bring color separations to Murphy Anderson's visual concepts out in, you know, the middle of somewhere in New Jersey. And, you know, uh, you know, where, where a bunch of old ladies would carve up Ruby Lift to, to so, do So your job separation. was to physically carry them there. Physically yeah. carry the color guides, right? So basically the way comics used to be colored is they would do it, you do a Xerox of the comic, and then a colorist would go in and sort of dye that to, you know, with, with these sort of custom mixed dyes to what colors they wanted represented on the page, and then kind of like make detailed notes on each little field of color to what the essentially like what the Pantone colors were, right? Like, kind of like, yeah. and then they would take four sheets of Ruby Lift. And based on that formula, would cut them out so that you know there was a red, a yellow, what well, no red, a green, a no red, blue, a yellow, yeah, Sites. red, blue, yellow, yeah, and and black, right? And they would cut out those those pieces of ruby, and then you'd lay those over each other, and that would make a four color comic. That's how they would make the negative. Uh, it was an incredibly laborious process, and you know, um, but it was super cool. I loved it. Right? It was, again, a, a thing that is kind of burnt into my brain. Um, and, you know, and, and then like the next time I saw Murphy Anderson, Murphy was like, oh, hey, Brian. And I'm like, oh, Murphy Anderson knows my name. Oh, my God. You know, because um, I mean, I, I loved like, you know, a to basically my favorite DC comic character growing up were, were the Atomic Knights, which Murphy Anderson drew. And so it was a big thrill for me. Um, okay. But anyway, so, you know, I started doing that. Uh, someone screwed up, didn't deliver a script. They needed a script. I wrote a script. I sold it. I sold three more scripts. I was still in high school and then somehow was made the editor of the company. And this was Deluxe know, Comics? This was del Deluxe slash Lodestone Comics. It was a sordid time, Josh. There was all sorts of wild shit going on. Uh, so Dave Singer... Who, who started with Deluxe Comics to do a book called Wallywood's Thunder Agents, believed that the Thunder Agents property was public domain. He had worked with someone named John Carbonero uh, somewhere else on a Thunder Agents project and then was like, no, I think this is public domain. I'm going to do it myself, but I'm going to build my own trademarkable name for the Thunder Agents. I'm going to call it Wallywood's Thunder Agents. It wasn't affiliated with Wallywood's estate, as it turns out, or anything. He just called it Wallywood's Thunder Agents. And uh, he got sued by John Carbonero, and then there was a whole thing. And so eventually he just started publishing additional comics, but he called that company Lodestone Comics. And so it was Deluxe Lodestone, and eventually, I don't know, it was, it was crazy. Um, there, was, there was comics journal articles you can read about it. If you do a little, you know, do a little research, there were dead skunks nailed to a, a door at one point. Um, by, by the way, by nobody who's, I've mentioned, a third party entirely uh, as a warning. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there was some whole detail about where, you know, people lived. Dave, Dave was, it was basically the office was a residential apartment on East 14th Street in Brooklyn. And so that was all, that was like a big brouhaha around the fact that it wasn't a proper commercial office, which the Comics Journal wanted to write about. And they sent people to see if 
where Dave actually lived. And then they wrote a whole article about how Dave lived with his mother. It was, <laughs> I kind of feel like, like if, if there was, was going like to be a, a yeah, that? like a, an oral history of this like period of time in comics, the title would be sorted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, you know, and, and it was crazy. Um, the, the, the big title that, that came out from, from Lodestone during that time was Dave Cockrum's Futurians, which is, so Dave Cockrum had left X-Men, had done a Futurians graphic novel for that Marvel graphic novel line, you know, those weird unwieldy graphic novels that, you know, didn't have any kind of bag board plan or <laughs> boxing plan or anything. Um, and then, but it was creator owned. And then he took it to Lodestone where three, I think three of the four issues were, were published. And then later I actually collected the three issues along with the unpublished fourth issue as a graphic novel from Eternity Comics. What were the, uh, the first scripts that you wrote, that you sold? I sold a script to Wally Woods Thunder Agents number three, which was, it was the team story. And it was like the conclusion of, uh, it was the conclusion to a, to a story. I, there was basically all these kind of like loose threads. I, I think I might've been filling in for Roy Thomas. Not I'm bad. pretty sure I was. <laughs> it's been a long time. Uh, but and then the story was uh, penciled and inked by Rich Buckler. And it, was, and it was gorgeous, right? It's just like, you know, not, not, not flashy, but just like the, the pinnacle of craft, you know? Um, and then I sold a story for um, a Lodestone title, which was like, they're sort of like Suicide Squad slash Mission, Miss, Mission Impossible title called Codename Danger. And, uh, I sold a story uh, that called IOU that was, I think, issue three, and it was drawn by Paul Smith and inked by Rich Buckler, which was, you know, pretty exciting as someone who was, you know, a giant X-Men nerd. Um, and then sold another Codename Danger story. I don't remember what the issue, what the story was called, and that was we had an artist, I don't remember who was going to do it, but they, they, uh, they dropped out at the last minute and we needed to find somebody. And we hired a young artist out of the Marvel bullpen who had previously only inked a couple of issues of Spectacular Spider-Man over Sal Buscema, but by all accounts was a really talented penciler and inker and his inks were pretty distinctive. So, you know, you had that idea that like, you know, he, he would bring his own style to a page and his name was Kyle Baker. And uh, so Kyle Baker, um, we, and then we needed the thing done in like two weeks or something. Like it was like one of those, you know, the deadlines right. just kept. And he was like, well, I'm going to San Diego Comic-Con this week. So, but I think I can still do it. And he apparently penciled the entire issue on a flight to San Diego where it was handed off to somebody for lettering. <laughs> um, and then he inked it uh, on the way back and like two days later handed, you know, two or three days after getting back, handed off the finished comic, you know? Yeah. So those, those were my, those are my three big, uh, I think my three big scripts that I, I saw back then. Cool. So you started at this, um, at Deluxe Lodestone as intern, gopher, yeah. whatever. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Got some writing Prototypical, gig. like over eager kid who yeah. just is willing to like probably murder someone, but was never asked to, to get into <laughs> comics. Right. And then, so, and then you got these sort of fill in writing jobs. Yep. And yeah. you made, you made your way into editorial there too. I was, yeah, I was, uh, I don't remember what my, I don't, I don't think I was editor in chief, but I was, I was editing um, the comics. I was also basically responsible for finding, you know, putting together the creative teams on things and, 
uh, going through the slush pile. That that's the the, the worst thing. Uh, I think you've probably seen. I've talked about this story on Twitter. Is uh, it was go through the slush pile, right? Here's this thing, right? And it would literally be you know a stack yay high of just submissions of people who are like, I want to write a comic, I want to draw a comic, I want to, you know, and and most stuff's bad, right? You know, or just naive about what a professional comic might look like or, or, you know, and, uh, but, you know, there was also some good stuff and found some artists that way and found some writers that way over the course of my career. But I open up one envelope and I start reading the cover letter and I'm like, no. It, it, it was from uh, Jerry Siegel, the writer of Superman. Yeah, creator. And, the creator of Superman. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Co-creator right? is, is Siegel and Schuster. And he was just looking to write comics. He had comics that he wanted to publish stories uh, that just, he couldn't get the time of day anywhere. And I'm like, man, I was like, I am a genius. I am going to, we're going to do this. Right. You know, and I start, I write him back. I, I this just kind of like, total fanboy letter, trying to sound as professional as possible, and, you know, talking about just, you know, created fucking Superman, right? The holy God, this is amazing. And uh, I, uh, you know, and he writes me back and he's really excited and, and I, I find an artist and I don't remember who the artist was. And it was, it was a book called, I think it was called, the Red, I wanna say it was The Red Mask was the name of the title. M-A-S-Q-U-E. And it was, it was kind of like steampunky science fiction, like, but not intentionally steampunky. It was a little out of date, right? It was a little, it felt a little golden agey, but to me in a way that was utterly charming, right? And I was like, you know, and 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 something that would just make total sense to to publish as is, you know, find the right artist, right? Like if Jerry Ordway had drawn it or something, you know, it would have just been the greatest thing ever. And uh, and Dave Singer was like, no, what are you talking about? Wait, this is basically says, this guy's old. Yeah. I'm like, what? what? He's like, yeah, he's old. He's out of date. Nobody wants to read this. And I'm like, Ugh. and I, I'm like practically crying, right? I, I, trying to figure out how do we, how do we publish this, right? Come on. There's got to be some way to publish this. And uh, eventually I, I just have to write Jerry Siegel a letter back and say, you know, I'm sorry, I overstepped. I, I don't have the ability to publish this. I, you know, and uh, and he wrote me back, a, 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 again, gracious, you know, and, and, and kind of weary letter. Right. Uh, that was like, and by the way, this is all like typewriter correspondence, put in an envelope, mailed from the post office, wait a week, kind of. Yeah. What year would you say this is? Approximately. I want to say this is 19, it's 84 or 85. It's probably 84. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe early, like very early 84. And uh, so no email, no Twitter, you know. and uh, he, you know, and it was just obvious that like, this is something that's happened to him before, you know, and, and that, um, and then, and then interestingly, the next sort of thing that happened at Deluxe after that, right, which was, you know, kind of heartbreaking is I met Evan. Uh, I met Evan at a, at a comic convention, Evan Dorkin, and was like, wow, this guy's stuff is just great, right? Like it's, you know, it, it reminded me of a lot of different popular artists but it also reminded me of you know it had this kind of punk energy to it and it was funny and he was obviously very talented and he was working with a writer uh on a book called figments p-h-i-g-m-e-n-t-s um and it, it was just this like super charming uh really engaging kind of like you know the kind of comic you wanted to dive into Right. And uh, I was like, wow, you guys should come up to the office. We should talk about this and see if there's some something we can do 
you know, with the company, they, they were, you know, really excited and uh, I brought them in and, and Dave basically, it was like, the, it was like uh, the three bears. He was like, these people are unestablished. <laughs> They're, nobody knows who they are. We don't, we don't use unestablished talent here at Deluxe Comics. Look around. We have Dave Cockrum and we have George Perez and we have Jerry Ordway and, you know, right. That right. Kind of, and I'm like, but I think there's this opportunity, right? Like to, to, to associate good young people with some of this talent, right? And, 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 you know, we can make the case that we think this person is, no, nope, nope. And so that didn't work out. Um, and that kind of was, and that happened a couple of times, right? Uh, there's, in fact, I can point to multiple artists who have gone on to have successful careers that got rejected that way. So um, Chris Cross, uh, who, who went on to do, who did Blood Syndicate for Milestone, Milestone and yeah. Captain Marvel and has done a bunch of um, Spider-Man stuff and um, someone I've known since he was, he's, he's basically the same age as me and I, I knew him through his art teacher in Brooklyn and uh, I brought him in and same thing. And then Ron Lim, same thing, um, you know, and, uh, and whatever you want to say about like someone, you know, th these were people who were obviously all up to the standards of being published as, as, as professional comic artists at the time. And um, so while all this is going on and, and I'm getting increasingly frustrated, um, <laughs> Dave is doing some weird deals to keep his company afloat uh, with Sunrise Distribution. Sunrise Distribution, Sun, Sunrise Distribution is, is Scott Rosenberg's company uh, and uh, Scott, Scott like has some, it's basically made a lot of money on like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, early editions and some other hot comics. You know, comics are starting to get hot. We're seeing speculation and, uh, and he's like definitely looking for the next thing. So he's buying like huge chunks of the Futurians number one print run um, and, 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 and trying to, to pump those up. And he's buying huge print runs of, uh, you know, um, Code Name Danger and trying to pump those up. And, um, and you know, it, it just becomes obvious to me that, you know, what he's interested in doing is creating a new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? He's interested in coming. And I was like, well, you know, I should, I should probably make a pitch to this guy and say like, look, why don't you back my company? I'm gonna start a company. I have this, this Figments book uh, and I have this, guy Ron Lim who's going to draw a book called The X-Mutants and um, I have a bunch of other things that you know people want to do from you know who are who are willing to work largely for royalties right like they're they're willing to you know sort of take a, some some amount up front but you know against uh, a percentage of sales and, and we can come up with it and he he was like yeah let's do it so suddenly I was a comic book publisher <laughs> So was that Eternity? And, and that was Eternity Comics, yeah. Eternity, and then we had a second imprint called Imperial, uh, which Imperial was just like, if someone sent us a book and the book was done, like if someone submitted a book like that slush pile, didn't quite matter how good it was. If it was <laughs> done, we would kind of publish it. Um, because at, at that point, the, the sales on Black and White Comics were crazy. And, and you know, and, and again, keep in mind, I, I'm still... Uh, a high school student at this point right so like i have no idea what i'm doing <laughs> I, really, <laughs> I really have no idea i i ended up um using dave campiti uh to um help recruit additional artists and talent and was working with um you know made made the mistake of you know, renting my office space from one of my writers, which, you know, puts you in a weird position in terms of being able to put demands upon them. Yeah. <laughs> You're a landlord. Um, but it was, it was an awesome, it was just such an amazing experience. Um, yeah, you know, I think that, um, you know, when I think of that time, so Ninja Turtles was like, 84 and then it like picked up steam until like 86 when things really broke it seemed that's my perception yeah um and like when i think of that time 
I kind of think of like the whole industry as still in high school and not knowing what they're doing. Like that's kind of, that's kind of how it, it felt from like just going back and surveying what was published. So, I, I mean, I'd love to hear more about that. Like, Oh, absolutely. I, I remember um, meeting, Oh, I wish I could remember his name. We had such an awesome time hanging out at San Diego. Um, but he was the, like, I think writer artist from Miami mice. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah. And he was, I think he might've even been a year younger than me. Right. <laughs> you know, somehow. And uh you know, I remember going to those San Diego Comic Cons back then, right? And it was just like so much underage drinking because everyone was, yeah, <laughs> everyone in that comic space was so young and so inexperienced and kind of so just excited to to be doing that. And, you know, and which was also created a lot of tension with people who were you know established in the industry. You know, definitely ran into stuff where I'm like. You know, I still loved great comics, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? And 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 there's a lot of stuff we did that I'm super proud of and and, and it's pretty amazing. But you know, it was it, there wasn't a lot of um discernment going on over over what would get published in there. And there was a lot of cynicism about what would sell and a lot of naivete about people I was working with uh on a on a on a sort of bigger stage, you know, sort of my the you know, Sunrise Distribution Group and and uh, Dave Campiti's company. And uh, there was a lot of splintering and, fract and fracturing of relationships um, that, you know, Scott would continually try to keep together. And eventually, you know, there were all these different groups publishing comics that Scott was backing that eventually we all consolidated into one company, which became uh, Malibu uh, Entertainment. Right. Yeah, I feel like, was it, I mean, uh, you can talk as much or as little. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Talk. I'll just keep talking about this time. No, so yeah. No, but I'm just I'm just saying, like, uh, if you don't want to get into like the sketchy uh, sketchy practices or whatever that were happening, but like mm -hmm. I I got the impression that there were a lot of sketchy practices happening, and that I, like there were a lot of like fly by night sort of companies, and not I'm not saying your your company, but um, no, no. Yeah, but uh, and then like a lot of you know like business backers who backed a lot of like little companies like that was large that was largely scott rosenberg yeah <laughs> that was, that was and what was the scott. idea what was the idea with that i mean like why uh i think was it just you know chaotic? he was just chasing that kind of teenage mutant ninja turtles success you know and and you know and eventually scott you know turned into a, you know um the 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 Malibu comics people who who came in and became part of Malibu Publishing, you know Tom Mason and Dave Ulbrich and and uh, Chris Ulm were were really good. They were professionals. They were older than most of the people. They were the grownups in the room, mm -hmm. and so they they did a lot to um, hone in on what what made sense as far as uh, Malibu. Right? They eventually become the architects of the Ultraverse. You know, and they, 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 uh, I think probably did a lot of the business development on the, the image deal early on. And, uh, uh, I was, I was long gone by then. I, I didn't want to move to California. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had an office in Brooklyn and I loved that. I love, you know, my friends and my family and, uh, you know, there was a girl involved somewhere that I didn't want to, you know, leave. And so I, I, I basically sold my share of the company for Met season tickets or something like that, you know, some really magic beans nonsense. Yeah. Um, so but, what years were you, were you eternity? Uh, so I think we started in 86. I want to say early 86, it might've been, we might've started up the company in 85, might've published, started publishing in 86. And I was there till probably like 1988 or so. Okay. Um, felt like a lot longer, right? It's this huge chunk of my life. I, I met so many people there that, you know, I'm still friends with and, uh, you know, do professional work with to today. You yeah. know, I mean, we had a lot of great people like, you know, Jimmy Palmiotti gets his first work, uh, as a first credited work in comics at Eternity yeah. Comics, Evan Dorkin, um, you know, Ron Lim, as I mentioned, uh, Dean Haspiel, um, 
with Martin Powell, who's gone on to become an incredibly successful writer. Martin Powell and Dean Haspiel did a book called The Verdict, um, which has a Howard Chaikin cover on the first issue, which was a thrill for me as someone who loved American flag. Mm-hmm. Um, had uh, Martin Powell also did a book, which is still in print to this day for us, called Scarlet and Gaslight, with an artist mm-hmm. named Seppo McKinnonen, which was a Dracula versus Sherlock Holmes um, self-contained story four issues, but the graphic novel has stayed in print continuously since, since the eighties. It's fantastic. Martin's so talented. Um, you know, um, Richard Case, uh, did, did work for us. Uh, some of his first work, um, uh, Scott Hanna was someone that I was like, Oh, you should be an anchor. Yeah. <laughs> <And he's laughs> like, All right. I guess that'll work out for me. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a, and a ton of people, who yeah. came through and, and and did stuff. And it was just such a, a great, you know, kind of like, um, I, you know, it's funny. I, I know a lot of people will look at something that didn't work out the way you wanted and look back on it sadly. I, I really look at, back on it with a lot of uh, joy, right? Because it was this like time of, hey, let's see what, let's learn stuff, right? Let's see what works. Let's see what doesn't work. Let's make friends. Let's hang out. Let's, you know, go out until four in the morning, wake up, come into work at noon, work until nine o'clock at night, go out again. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a great time. It kind of reminds me of like some of my own experience during the, like the first dot com boom, where it's like just all this like enthusiasm and it's like, you know, six months feels like a huge chunk of your life because so, because so, so many things are passing in and out of your life during that time. I mean, so 86 to 88, like that's, a boom and then when is the bust is so, i mean it, it's busting almost the entire time right yeah you know we we have like you know when we do x mutants number one sales are somewhere around ninety thousand copies and then you know and, and multiple books that we did in proximity to that all had like 30 and forty thousand copy print runs and then it, but it, you know the the print runs kind of steadily decline right and that was also part of i think the impetus for Scott, right, was uh, publishing a lot of stuff is you would always get a lot of excitement around a number one. So right. <laughs> it was always putting out a lot of number ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but the numbers, the numbers just kept coming back, you know, um, declining and the, the sort of sense of throwing stuff up against the wall and seeing if it would stick didn't really work, right? This is right around the time that you're starting to see Dark Horse comics emerge out of that black and white boom as like kind of like, oh, what if we took a more considered approach? <laughs> right, but it's funny because one of their first titles was the uh, Forest the Bear funny animal, like right. nin- Ninja Turtles uh, yep. sort of spoof. That was what every everybody got in that way, right? Like yeah. that was just, right? You were doing either like martial arts comics somehow because of Frank Miller and Turtles or you were doing, you know, funny animal stuff because of turtles. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when I, um, when I look at, all, at the, like all the, I love digging through quarter bins and finding all of the, the books from that time period. And so many of them uh, look really bad, but I still get a kick from the enthusiasm, right? Like it right. all, it, it just, it feels like people who aren't sure the best way to make comics, but they're going to try anyway. And you know, see what happens. Do you, did it work out for um, the business on the business side for people? Like I I kind of, I'm curious about the, the business part of it. Like was the audience speculators or was there just a huge appetite for the material that was like a fad? Uh, You know, I don't think there was ever really a huge appetite for stuff on the part of consumers. I think Mm -hmm. consumers, like there were, there were people who would buy, right. It's like, Oh, here's a comic. And it's it's got you know people doing things and you know you might have that reaction to something that was happening on the cover or the art or but it wasn't it wasn't like there was a huge clamor for everything that was being put out there right unfortunately i think the burden of a lot of this and this is not something i understood at the time at all was that a lot of the burden of this fell on comic stores who felt like they couldn't afford to miss out on anything you know, and I, you know, I, there were, there were, you know, 
I, I imagine that any comic stores that have survived to this time, if you go into their basements, <laughs> there's probably still a lot of long boxes of bad black and white comics. Um, from, from right, that era. right next to the uh, long boxes full of uh, bad image comics. Sure. Yeah. Yes. I mean, and th this is true of every kind of like boom, right? That that happens, right? Like every type of speculator frenzy that happens around the comic space, yeah. right? You know, I mean, think about like Magic the Gathering, right? Think about like Magic comes out in 93, blows up in 94, all of a sudden, you know, people are opening game stores and doing things and, you know, cards are going up in value and, you know, wizards can't print cards fast enough. And not only do they glut the market with, you know, fallen empires and the dark and, and whatever else and, and substandard product, right? Um, also, every single company that had a line on printing presses and cardboard yeah. gets gets into making games right you know uh and there were there were probably from from like 94 to you know 99 there were probably 250 trading card games launched right you know um and it, it's the same thing right and as as the store owner i got my comeuppance for <laughs> for my time at eternity right because i carried a lot of those games and yeah. got stuck with a lot of that product and <laughs> so, right so yeah, like so you you end up starting a, a game store in New York later. But um, was the the comics the store that you worked at the comic store that you worked at when you were much younger was that your uh, main comics retail experience? Uh, so no, no, no. Uh, I was trying to. I, I have a button for the store somewhere. Someone gave it to me recently. Com what comic book comic book scene in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, it was not the stories about that store alone are um you know just ridiculous um, it, it was you know it was like there was a guy who came to the store who was like basically the robert de niro character from goodfellas he was like a hijacker right he would hijack trucks and heist and and hold up warehouses and I'm pretty sure he held up the Charleston warehouse and had all of these kind of like uh, Charleston kind of like bound editions of like Richie Rich one through 20 and like these, oh my God, these gorgeous like, um, oh, I can't remember what her name is now, the character. She was kind of like a, a, a jungle character from Charleston back then. Um, but But all these like amazing books and write like these, and he was always trying to sell them. And like, if someone like, oh, let me, let me see if I can do anything with them. And if you held on to the books, the VIG was running. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. It was, <laughs> it was, it was crazy, right? It was just like this bizarre. Um, and, and the reason he found out about the comic store is because he sold drugs to the guy who owned the comic shop. And, you know, so, right. you know, it's that kind of like, uh, you know, really early '80s Brooklyn heyday, but it was it was an amazing store, right? Because I met friends that I've you know kept for life there and had opportunities, and you know, right? It was just like you know, it was like in the middle of Brooklyn, where you know when it was not cool to be nerdy, yeah, right? It was not cool to like this stuff. So you find these people who are, you know, like you, these kind of like adrift in this see of Don Mattingly Yankees kind of uh you know it was the you know you know that that kind of just uh Brooklyn bravado you know yeah. um but you know so and you know met met some amazing people that way my my, my oldest friend my my best friend Tony uh met him there and you know we I probably haven't gone you know however you know oh, uh, multiple days without talking to him and the however got is it 40 years? I don't even know. You know, for yeah, it is. It's more than 40 years, right? Like since. So um yeah. <laughs> so so then you worked at another comic store, too? I did. I did. I so so in between my deluxe comics, so deluxe comics happens, they get sued, they kind of go out of business, they eventually reopen as Lodestone Publishing, and then there's this kind of window in between where I'm like, I need to, what am I gonna do? Right? Like I'm 
I want to work in comics. So I went to work for Forbidden Planet. And uh, Forbidden Planet is like the most famous comic store in the world at the time, right? It's, it's, it's in New York, uh, it's in the East Village. And it was like this unbelievable um, church to nerdy things, to, to, to comics, to toys, to books, to, you know, golden age comics that they had in this back room to, it was, it was unbelievable. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I went to work there and, you know, I, I was still pretty naive. And uh, the first day I got there and I worked and I did my thing and uh, everybody gets out of work. Everyone gets to the train station, right? Union Square train station, which is like, you know, everyone, it's kind of like a hub, you know, in New York and it's going to take you in all these different directions. And everybody just gets to the platform of the train station and just starts opening up their backpacks or, or messenger bags or whatever they, and just shows all the stuff they stole from work. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god what is going on you know and um the rumor the rumor was that the manager of the store gave a copy of incredible hulk one through six to a famous musician to get that musician to produce his first album um you know, and, and there's all sorts of stuff like that. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was incredible. And there were celebrities all the time, right? Like I uh, had, a, a, you know, honestly, almost until he died at an ongoing kind of like sneer off with Rick Ocasek uh -huh. from he working a, at Forbidden Planet. He was a comics reader? He, yeah. And, and, and well, you know, it didn't even have to be a comics reader, right? Like you just had to be like someone who liked nerd culture, mm. right? Like, so like, Deborah Harry and, and, and Chris Stein would come in all the time. And, you know, uh, Rick Ocasek came in, Joe Jackson would shop there all the time. Celebrities would come in, you know, from, from, you know, outside of music. And, but, um, uh, so one of the things you would have to do is sometimes you would have to be the guy who would ask people to check their bags. And so Rick, Rick Ocasek, and I loved asking celebrities to check their bags. I'm just like a contrary person at that point, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of people would let him go. And I'm like, sorry, you got to check your bag. Yeah. You, and you, you get that, you know who I am and you'd be like, no, who are you? Right. <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, anyway, I asked Rick Ocasek, Paulina Poroskova and a, a kid who's probably Rick Ocasek's kid. And the kid didn't want to check his bag. And I, I insisted. And, uh, I, <laughs> and I just, I just really stuck to my guns on it. And I was really kind of belligerent. I, you know, whatever, bad day. I, I have no idea, but um, I decided I was just going to be, you know, stick to that. Anyway, he, he eventually checks his bag and, but, you know, he's kind of shooting me daggers. And, and so I got my friend, Tony, aforementioned Tony, to um, go up to Rick Ocasek and Polina Poroskova and ask them to switch their heads, like in the music video. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, And he did, and they were just looking at him like, and I just literally fell over from behind the back issue bin laughing my ass off. Uh -huh. um, and like from that day forward, and like it's like 10 interactions, 12 interactions over the years, I would see Rick Ocasek walking around the East Village, right? I would always be in the East Village. He's always these. And like he'd have his Ray-Ban sunglasses on and he would just walk by me and he would just shoot me a death glare. Yeah. Right. You know, it was awesome. <laughs> Everyone remembers that jerk from the comic store. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, yeah. Yeah. Probably so, could have done things differently there, but you know. <laughs> hey. I was um, a kid. Yeah. So, what did you do um, between when you left Eternity and when you started uh, Neutral Ground? Uh, so I got involved in public relations. I, uh, it was, you know, kind of something I was good at. Obviously you can see how I handled the Rick Ocasek account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
<laughs> uh, I, I got involved in public relations and uh, took a series of jobs in that space that were all um, sold ending uh-huh. uh, and uh, quit all of those jobs upon realizing sort of like it was it was just like some elaborate joke, you know. You know, it's like, you know, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to sh- shed some light on this company deforesting the Brazilian rainforest. Oh, OK, that sounds great. It's like, yeah, well, because we actually deforest it much more, our client. And so we really want McDonald's to bear the brunt of this attention uh-huh. and not us. And I'm like, no, you know, I don't want I don't want to work here. I don't want to do this. You know, oh, our product kills almost as many people, but we want their product. To, you know, it was always things like that. And so I, I did that a couple of times and then eventually landed at a nonprofit that was doing um, preserving public space in New York, uh, doing PR there for a little while, which I kind of enjoyed. It was, it was a lot of fun. But um, my job put me in proximity to Jim Hanley's universe, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. which was a store that was actually like my favorite comic store of all time. And a store that I, I, I discovered through meeting Evan and uh, and they had been on Staten Island. They had opened a New York store. And so I would on my lunch break go over to the store and hang out and buy comics. And and I was like, oh, I, I kind of want to be back in comics. You know, I was kind of, I think I want to be back in the comic space. And so I uh, <laughs> I literally did the same thing. I was like, I will work in your comic store. Like, you know, I don't really care what menial job you have for me. I'll be Christmas help. I'll stock shelves. I don't really care. I just want to be around comics. And I know that my sort of enthusiasm and sort of the sort of central location of the store will result in me finding opportunities in the comic space. And uh, so that's what I did. I quit (laughs) doing public relations and took a job as Christmas help at Hanley's and was like became the direct basically the director of marketing for them uh you know doing like big signing events so this is around now the time that image is coming out so we did like huge events around you know wildcats number one and young blood number one and um did a bunch of like we did a madman signing with uh mike allred and uh, a bone signing with Jeff Smith, you know, kind of balancing things out a little bit in terms of, yeah. you know, uh, the comics good. Um, and uh, yeah, and did, did that for a little while. Um, but somehow in the middle of doing all that and starting to like, you know, talk to Billy Tucci about working on She and, you know, talking with Jimmy and Joe about doing something else in comics, I started playing magic. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and basically got derailed from comics for the next 20 years. <laughs> sort yeah. of. I mean, I kept going back and doing a bunch of different weird things, but um, magic just like took over uh, the front of my brain. Right. Uh, from that moment on. Right. Same thing. Right. It was like very similar to that X-Men 141 experience. Yeah. Right? As soon as like you understood the game and you understood some of the things connected to the secondary market and to, to building a deck and, you know, collecting cards. It, it just, it, 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 it hit all the buttons in my brain in a way that, um, you know, took over. So, you know, I started running events and opened a store and eventually started doing some work for wizard wizards of the coast as a contractor. And yeah. Then I, met, I mean, and then I met, and then I met Josh. So, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. You were in a really pivotal, pivotal spot. Like then, I mean, it was like a, another you know kind of lightning strike moment when magic happens but you you were like it seemed like you knew how to run a nerd store like a store of nerd stuff and you know you started running like some of the first big tournaments yeah we we in so we ran a tournament for a set of legend no a set of arabian nights Mm -hmm. so we gave away a set of arabian nights which was you know several hundred dollars at the time uh for we gave away a set of arabian nights and it was uh november of 94 yeah and so we we rented a hotel ballroom I actually rented it's funny i rented the hotel ballroom at the roosevelt hotel and it was because that's where um creation comic conventions were always held 
So, yeah. you know, I was like, oh, I know that. I know that room. I know that space really well. I know how to sneak in there. I know what to, <laughs> you know. Um, and so, uh, yeah, started doing that. And then within six months had uh, a store in, in Manhattan called Neutral Ground. And uh, yeah, and that was really, I mean, really that, that you know, and I, I did a bunch of comic book work in there. I did some work for Marvel. I, I did some work for Billy Tucci. I um, did a couple of different things, but it was all, you know, kind of like a sideline to uh, being at Neutral Ground. So, yeah. And then, yeah. So, but it was fun. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, I have a note here. Um, this is, I don't know when in the, the history this is, but I remember you telling me about commissioning work from Jack Davis. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. That's so, so, yeah. So I, I don't go, I guess I don't go directly into PR. Um, I, I do some work. <laughs> I do some work for this guy, Ron Marion. Ron lived on Staten Island and he had gotten the rights to make the Honeymooners comic, which is, which, and the reason I, I knew about this and was connected to it is because it was a book that had passed through the Deluxe Lodestone offices a few years before. And I, I knew the people there and I got connected to him and I, and so I was the, I was the editor there for uh, the Honeymooners comic and for um, a couple of oddball projects, one of which was a book called Lunatic Binge, which was like a horror anthology. And so we, um, we got to commission, yeah, I mean, two covers from Jack Davis. One was a Honeymooners cover. So it's like, it's like a Jack Davis like TV guide cover. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, like, oh my God. And um, the other was a horror cover, which is like a Boris, Boris Karloff style Frankenstein reading the actual comic that he's yeah. in, right? You know, like <laughs> kind of an infinite cover. And uh, yeah, there's like kind of pretty, pretty heady, crazy stuff, right? Like just to see those like pieces come in and, you know, give feedback on them and, and yeah. Yeah. I remember that. I, I just like, this is why I wanted to talk to you because like, you know, I, I heard that like heartbreaking Jerry Siegel story and like all these little like hints of, you know, shady comic book store. Oh my God. And it was so, it was so shady. And the funny thing is I, I have no idea. I, I don't know what happened. Like I in like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why I didn't publish that Jerry Siegel comic. At eternity and I, I i don't know and again it may be that i just didn't have i don't have any of those letters right like yeah, i didn't yeah. keep copies so and it wasn't like email so it may be that i just didn't have his address or know how to get in touch with him um but uh yeah yeah it was, i mean uh, and you were a teenager so yeah 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 <laughs> yeah 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 very yeah so but it was uh yeah, that was a that was a heartbreaker. I mean, it was just really like it seemed it was one of those really like disillusioning moments. Right. Where you're like, clearly everybody is just even if even if the comic's lousy, right? Even if it's freaking terrible, you're just gonna buy it, right? It was like some early kind of Patreon brain in my head. You'll just <laughs> buy the comic to support him, right? Like right, right. it makes total sense. And, yeah. uh, and that just, uh, yeah. And, the, and, and it wasn't that, that vision wasn't shared by the, by the people I was working with. Right. But did what do they uh, know? They, they let a 15 year old edit their comics. What the hell did they know? <laughs> well, you probably were uh, willing to work for cheap. Oh, I mean, I, I got paid at some point pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. The, the working for cheap was never the long-term plan. Well, right. But I, I mean, I, I imagine like, I don't know. The business people behind the business in those days weren't above exploiting teenage labor. Oh no, oh, God, no. <laughs> not, not at all. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't. I don't think. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know that working papers were ever presented or anything like that. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Um, I don't really have any other questions. But are there any other like notable things you'd want to talk about from that time, or just like how you feel about the 
you know, your time in comics in general, it seems like you're pretty, uh, I don't know. I feel like you've had a bit of a charmed career. Like, like I was several charmed careers almost. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. I would, I, I feel very fortunate to have played around in that space, met the people that I've met. I would love to obviously be able to go back and do a bunch of stuff over in hindsight, right. Be more selective sure. about stuff and, you know, fight, fight for certain things a little harder. Um, you know, uh, not, not really. I mean, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know this. I mean, I'm, as soon as we hang up, I'm going to remember like nine funny stories about things. Right. But, uh, well, you gotta <laughs> save something for the memoirs. Yeah. <laughs> What's your yeah. favorite, uh, your favorite stuff that you published? Uh, oh, that's, that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, I love Pyrocore. Yeah. I love Pyrocore. Uh, it's, uh, really one of my favorite comics. I, I, and it, it is also, a big part of why I started publishing comics, right? Because it was that meeting with Evan. And the, the funny thing about it is, so, you know, um, Evan comes into Eternity, he's gonna do figments with us. I have this falling out with Dave Campiti, who then gets, spins off this company called, I think Pied Piper Press. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he lures away a bunch of projects that we've got working with us. Uh, including figments, Alan Rollins and Evan Dorkin go. And Alan, Evan and I didn't start off as, as great friends. We started off, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I was the comics guy, you know, I was a publisher. I was associated with some CD characters, maybe. He was pretty cynical, you know, skeptical uh, about right. my motivations. But, you know, I, I really was a fan of his work. And uh, I remember going out and signing the contract for, for figments and he was, talking to me about this Avengers pitch he had, right? He's like, oh yeah, I've got this pitch. It's for these characters and they're these space pirates and they're gonna steal uh, the ultimate nullifier, right? It's just like this, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, Evan, why is this an Avengers comic? And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, why is this the Avengers? Like, why isn't this just your comic about these characters? The Avengers, are, 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 are just so you can say you're doing a Marvel book here right? or pitching a book at Marvel. It's not what you want to do. You want to tell stories about these characters. You want to tell these stories about, you know, your ex-girlfriend and, you know, all this other stuff that, that's, you know, is obviously woven through all of this. Um, and he's like, ah, ha, ha, right, you know, whatever. Uh -huh. And so anyway, he goes off. He take, They take figments over to Pied Piper. They, they put out maybe one issue and then, uh, Dave and Evan come to like an inevitable conclusion. Uh, and, uh, and Evan calls me up at the eternity office is just drunk, just drunk and really kind of belligerent. He's like, so do you want to? I'm like, what do I, do I want? He's like, do you want to publish Pyrocore? Do you want to publish that book? You said, you said that I should do that book. I'm like, well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that book, you know? And he's like, all right. And he hung up. <laughs> That's how we, <laughs> it's kind of like the really long convoluted ro road to, to getting to Pyrocore. Yeah. And which, you guys are still friends. Which ends up being something I'm, oh, yeah, yeah. In intermittently at times, but yes. <laughs> still talk to him all the time. And I have multiple pieces of art. I have the first milk and cheese drawing mm -hmm. up on the wall behind me, the, the small narrow piece, which was... Drawing on, a, a on a napkin yeah it is it is i have a whole collection of uh n original napkin artwork from uh going out to bars and you know late night dives for food and just talking about ideas so uh, the first milk and cheese was inspired by a menu item for huevos rancheros at ponchitos in the <laughs> west village and it started in fact before um before there was milk and cheese, there was huevos rancheros and the dinner creeps were these sort of like napkin characters that he would continue drawing. And somehow um, that evolved into milk and cheese. And I can still remember him drawing those characters. Or some, you're like, wow. I don't know why, why that works, but it works. And it was just a bunch of, you know, stuff that I kept over the years. And I was like, I think this is the first drawing of milk and cheese. He's like, yeah, that is. So, yeah. It's real cool. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, thanks for publishing Pirate Core. I was a, uh... 
that was a very uh, important comic to me when I oh, was awesome. younger. Yeah. That's amazing to me. Yeah, <laughs> that and uh, also um, the verdict with, with Martin Powell and Dean Haspiel and uh, the um, Scarlet and Gaslight are all books that I, I really, from, from Eternity very specifically, Mm -hmm. uh, that I'm super proud of. Also, just the Futurians graphic novel, which is like, you know, as someone who, again, really came into comics through the X-Men having, you know, you know, executive vice president, Brian Marshall, that was my name at the time, um, you know, inside the front cover of this hardcover of the Futurians is, you know, something I'm like, oh, that's me. Not that <laughs> yeah. I ever got a copy of the hardcover. I actually bought the copy of the hardcover for a dollar from a street vendor in the East Village years later. Like somewhere within like the last 15 years, I didn't even know there was a hardcover edition of it. Uh, maybe so it was boosted from a, a warehouse by that guy. It probably, <laughs> <laughs> it probably um, I, I'll, one day I'll tell that. I mean, that was, that was, that was crazy. Uh, yeah. There was, you know, arcade machines and Vaseline jars filled with cocaine and, you know, stolen comics and yeah, just, and yeah, what a, yeah. all that other Those stuff sounds like, yeah, that's that sounds like stolen goods. Comics, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the weird thing, right? Like, I and I, the funny thing is, I think this guy ended up loving comics. Like, he ended <laughs> up like, like he 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 got into it because he stole all these comics, and would go to comic stores, and then eventually, kind of like, developed a kind of like collection and things that he liked and like i remember him asking me to steal carl burks donald ducks years later from the forbidden planet <laughs> he's like you think you could steal me some of those carl burks donald ducks i'm like no yeah. i no no they... <laughs> that's that's a character for you right like and I'm like and just ended up just I, I can't even imagine his collection you know i i i don't even remember the guy's name or but like yeah he <laughs> A great collection that he didn't pay for. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, no, eventually that's the funny thing is he would trade and pay. And, you know, it was like anything else. Once he started getting into the hobby and having opinions about stuff, he couldn't just sort of like smash and grab whatever was there. Right. Like he, he at some point needed to, to collect things and buy things and trade for things and, and, and somehow, you know, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so weird <laughs> it's a, it was a strange space yeah all right well you're doing something with comics now huh like I, something i don't understand whatsoever but uh i, I would I, love I, to hear an explanation sure so um i am making nft comic books mm -hmm. but um so, so, so since my time with Eternity Publishing, and I, I haven't published comics since then yeah. myself, uh, one of the things that I've always wanted to do with comics, with the medium, is find ways to get people comics for free that they can read. And uh, we're, we're doing that in the NFT space. So we are selling... So look, people have no problems paying however much money to comiXology to own a digital comic that they right. don't actually own, right? You don't own it. You can't sell it. You can't trade it. You can't, um, if comiXology goes away, that comic goes away. If, you know, who knows what happens if Marvel's license with comiXology expires, right? Does that comic still yours? All of that stuff. With an NFT comic, you own the comic. It's yours. You can sell it. You can buy it. You can trade it. You can destroy it. You can do whatever. Um, that makes sense to me, right? As someone who's been a, a collector my whole life. But I also understand that there's people who won't want to do that, right? But might want, might be interested in, in what we're doing. So um, coming out of years of working in the game space and, and doing free to play games and other types of games, we're, we're, we're trying to do free to read comics. So we're publishing these comics there. They go on sale. So we, we just had a book emergence presents number one come out last week. Mm -hmm. It's on sale as an NFT. It's like eh, around somewhere between eight and $11, depending on the 
fluctuations in the price of the cryptocurrency of the blockchain it's on, it's on the Tezos blockchain. And, uh, and you can buy it, you can own it, you can read it. Starting this week, we'll be serializing the three eight page stories in the comic for free on our reader, interpopcomics.com. So you can go there and you can read the comic um, and, and enjoy it. Um, but one of the other things we're doing is because we can sort of actually interact with people who own this thing once they own it, you know, where you have this token of ownership, we can create these opportunities for people who own the comics to have a say in the comics on an ongoing basis. So we gave away um, copies of our first issue, which was this comic called The Nine Number Zero. We gave those away as an NFT. So they, they exist on the blockchain, you own that. Uh, if you own it right now, you can go to interpopcomics.com and vote on three sketches for an upcoming cover from the comic and decide which of those covers becomes the official you know, cover that the artist will then, you know, put to finish line art and color and everything like that. Um, for Emergence Presents, there's three characters that debut in that first issue. You can vote on which of those characters you'd like to see be the first to return to that to that comic. And then ongoing within like the nine and, and a third comic we're doing called Zoe MG, you actually get to vote on things that will happen from issue to issue of the comic. So you can decide on certain cosmetics for the characters, you know, like, hey, we're going to introduce a character next month. Is her costume this or this, yeah. right? Is the cover this or this? Does this person go here or here, right? There's certain branching decisions that people can vote on, but we're, we're also going to, um, some characters are going to die uh, over the course of this first six months of us telling these stories and, and, and ongoing, right? It's a, um, very much informed by my, sort of 80s comic brain and mm -hmm. uh, you know characters are gonna are, are not gonna make it through this run of issues alive and those outcomes are going to be determined largely by by uh fans voting on them people who own and you need to own an nft to participate in a vote so we're trying to find additional reasons that you want to own um these digital comics again we're trying to keep them pretty low price you know they're not crazy but we we also do have some high-end Variant covers, limited editions. Um, yeah, I was looking at the website. Artwork. It looked like you have some pretty, um, like, hot artists doing some of Mike, that. Mike Allred, there. Bill Sienkiewicz, Amanda Connor, Cliff Richard, Yuko yeah. Shimizu, um, Adriana Mello. I'm not going to remember everybody. We did nine different variant covers for the first issue. Yeah, um, and and you know, and we're and you know, they're they're not inexpensive but you also don't need them you can just read the comic for free right right now um but they're also going to be pretty scarce when when all is said and done and um you know we'll, we'll see what happens from there but and you're the uh, editor of the I'm comic the publisher i'm the, the publisher. publisher of the comics. okay yeah this is this is my my company it's called interpop we're making comics and games um in the nft space um i am also the um world builder for this superior universe like I, I built out this is all um the, these characters were all created by me for uh, a gaming universe that has now become a comic universe as well right yeah i remember yeah. i have the game that uh yeah that yeah, yeah. kick-started like a while yeah. ago with, yeah. with, with these yeah emergence so we've updated them a little bit since then they they, they look slightly different but uh largely the same <clears throat> and uh yeah it's, it's really exciting we um you know, we've gotten some really nice feedback on the first issue of Emergence Presents. We just had a, our first like really glowing review, which was really exciting. And uh, um, I, I'm really uh, enjoying uh, create, creating, a, you know, a world where, where these characters all exist. And now people are coming in and, you know, having people come in and say, oh, I want to tell a story with that character. I want to draw that character, right? I love that. I love that that's happening. And that, um, you know, again, as someone who grew up with Marvel Origins and Son of Origins and reading about how the Marvel Universe was created and all the different people who worked on it, like having some uh, opportunity to uh, populate a world with characters and then have creators come in and, and tell stories in that space is thrilling for me, right? I, yeah. I just love it.
Yeah. Well, and I'm excited that you're back back in comics. Yeah. Oh yeah. I I, I love it. It's 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 so much fun. Um, and uh, you know, yeah. And and I, I I think the the stories are fun. It's 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 very much a um, love letter to the superhero genre, right? That's yeah. that's how I would describe it. It is it is it is modern, right? Like we're not we're not doing like retro, but it is also very much knows where it came from and is not, you know, we're not doing gritty Batman memes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we're not, you know, we're, we're <laughs> letting our character, our superhero characters be fantastic and do, and do crazy stuff. And, you know, we're, we're not, we're not getting too far into worrying about the physics and the economic <sighs> impact of a billionaire and right. whether his money would be better spent on philanthropic efforts instead of building Batmobiles. You know, we're, we're not getting, we're not going down that road. Right. Right. So cool. We're enjoying it. So yeah. So yeah. So I'm back in comics, but I'm also, you know, still doing games and yeah, there's a game component too. Yeah. 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 So, well, uh, that's yeah, exciting. exciting. I yeah. mean, um, you know, it's funny because I like I before I knew you, I was a fan of of your, you know, work in magic. And having like when I became more involved in that community and when I met you and stuff. And I've seen you interact so much with fans and like, I can't think of anyone, you know, that's also a, a space that at times can be seedy and not, you know, gaming can like gamers sure. can sometimes like, you know, notoriously behave badly, but like in all the time, like anytime I see you, you interacting with fans, like you just seem like the most um, genuine and generous uh, person in the scene and like, I feel like, you know, pretty universally respected and, and I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm glad I, to have met you. Oh man, I, I appreciate that, Josh. I'm, I'm so glad to have met you and, and right to, to also find out like that, hey, you know, some comic book that I wanted, you know, that I published that had some impact on you, right? Like that's, you know, kind of amazing to me. And then to Yeah, no, thanks so much for your time and for, oh. for sharing your, your cool stories. Okay, hopefully, hopefully I don't, you know, open up any uh cold case investigations into the charleston warehouse uh, robbery <laughs> of you know 1982 or whatever it was yeah but, no uh, i think all the you know the statute of limitations on all comics beef is run out but maybe not. We'll you you'd be surprised you'd yeah. be surprised the beef stuff is is uh is still out there but anyway thanks josh i appreciate it okay thanks brian all right